All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the 2022 National Ryan White Conference on HIV Care and Treatment Session. Today, our session is going to prom, incorporating the patient's voices in quality improvement. My name is Tanya Bowers, and I am a nurse consultant within HRSA HABS um, Clinical Quality Branch, or CQM for short. And I will be serving as your moderator today. I want to thank you all for joining us this afternoon and joining this session. As you participate in this session, we, we ask that you please feel free to add your questions and your comments in the chat box. And at the conclusion of our session, the presenters will um, have an opportunity to address your questions and your comments. So with that being said, I hope you all enjoy today's session and we can get started. Welcome um, to our uh, presentation today. Um, the title for our presentation and workshop is Incorporating the Patient Voices in Quality Improvement, Prompts and Prems, an Emerging QI Topic. I'm very excited to have so many of you in our um, session today. And I am Clement Steinberg. I'm the director for the Center for Quality Improvement and Innovation. And I have the pleasure to have two of my co-presenters here with me today. And I will ask them to quickly introduce themselves. Uh, Martha, do you wanna quickly uh, say hello and introduce yourself? And then maybe Valerie, you can go next. Absolutely. So my name is Martha Cameron. I am uh, the executive director of the International Community of Women Living with HIV. But I am an experienced expert with CQII and a person living with HIV. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Valerie Reist here. I'm the Client Services Director with AIDS Ministries, AIDS Assist in South Bend, Indiana. Um, I'm also in charge of our clinical clinical quality management program, um, and I'm looking forward to just sharing our experiences in the Proms and Proms pilot um, later on in this presentation. Thank you. Very excited to have both of you there. I'm sharing um, very different um, experiences, and we're really excited to hear more from you. Um, up front, uh, we want to state that uh, the three of us, um, we have no relevant financial interest to disclose at this point. So uh, before we start, I wanted to quickly uh, plug a CQII. Um, uh, many of the things you hear um, today were supported by CQII. We are a HRSA HIV AIDS Bureau funded cooperative agreement. And um, we are housed at the New York State Department of Health AIDS Institute. And our mission is really to provide support and coaching to invite recipients and subrecipients just like you to uh, measurable uh, improve the competency around clinical quality management programs, as well as to measurably um, improve patient care, health outcomes, and patient satisfaction. And I think to come back to PROMS and PREMS, PROMS stands for Patient Reported Outcome Measures and Patient Reported Experience Measures. And I think those are really important elements um, to improve patient care outcomes and satisfaction. Um, some of you may know that many of the offerings that are available to you at no cost. Um, so we not only provide um, quality improvement resources, um, whether you visit us on our, on our website, um, can be easily accessed by cqii.org. We house the Target HIV site. We also present at national conferences, and we have many, many guides available to you. And very exciting, we announced today that we will actually have a PROMS and PREMS implementation guide available, a step-by-step -step guide that with the help of Valerie, Martha, and many others, we'll be able to put together not only what they are, how you can implement them, but also how to, some of the best practices to be learned along the way of our national pilot. Uh, for CQI, we also provide quality improvement trainings. Uh, many of you may have heard about this. We're also gonna put uh, a link in the chat. And then also we provide for those of you who make a request to her, so we also um, can send some of our wonderful QI coaches um, and content, expert, content experts uh, nationally to your site to help you. And lastly, our community of learning. Um, one of the examples I will share today is our pilot, and that I think clearly put in the category of communities of learning, since we were able to get um, eight to 10 sites to really participate in our pilot. Here are some of the learning objectives for today. 
Um, I think we want you to walk away with the following. First of all, to really understand the importance of integrating the voices of patients living with HIV served by your brand-wide program in quality improvement activities and really show you how this really can play out when you set up measurement systems and when you really think about what to do with the results that you've gained from those measurement activities. We also want to learn a lot about the emerging topics of PROMS and PREMS. Again, we're using those acronyms, so patient-reported outcome measures versus patient-reported experience measures, and really share with you some of the results of our national pilot and really help you how you can learn about this, um, this really emerging, very exciting opportunity um, and integrate it into your in current ongoing quality improvement activities. And lastly, we want to discuss some of the barriers that you may or may not face to implementing PROMS and PRAMS, and maybe some strategies to overcome them. Um, in terms of the PROMS and PRAMS um, background, and I think this is really important to me, and I want to uh, quote here Melissa Curry, one of our um, coaches, um, uh, individual with lived experience, and she said, the patterns of your practice are directly related to the silent voices of your patients. What are your patients not saying, but is evident in, you, in their, their actions and your outcomes? And I think it's a very important um, starting point for our discussions about thinking about um, what patients are telling us, and often what they are not telling us, but act accordingly, and we need to find ways to capture that. So we, we went on this journey of PROMS and PRAMS starting now close to a year and a half ago. And we started out with some focus groups and we basically asked providers to join us and to talk about what they know, what they don't know about PROMS and PRAMS. And we issued a, a, a summary report that's available to you if, if you want to. And we heard three things. One is the concept of PROMS and PRAMS at the time this was conducted, this is now over a year ago, was not very familiar with our participants. And they were, on one hand, there was a knowledge gap clearly identified, but they also clearly wanted to learn more. And there was lots of interest and genuine interest in learning more about this for use and adoption in the site. And lastly, they want guidance and support and something that we felt very important um, to do. Then uh, we conducted a literature overview. Um, we wanted to basically see in the field what is currently out there? What is some of the definitions being used? What are some of the strategies being used? And um, we offer the following um, definitions for the purpose of this presentation today. So PROMS, again, patient reported outcome measures. Um, in a GV care is essential because it can improve patient clinician communication, symptom recognition, treatment adherence, and clinical decision-making, including engaging in treatment option and choice. It's very important that maybe your clients come two, three times a year, uh, but often we don't know much about their outcomes in terms of their well-being, in terms of their quality of life. Often there's not enough time um, in a clinic visit to address them. However, um, they, those outcomes often determine an optimal treatment outcome or not. Friends, um, the definition we offer here today is to assess PREMS patient report experience measures in a clinical HIV setting allows the patient to discuss the experience of care and interaction with the healthcare system. Communication between the patient and the healthcare team may improve. It's basically the idea that we want to know, are we meeting the needs of the patient through the clinic visit? Are there issues such as, um, you know, stigmatization going on? Did they feel welcome? was the flow of that experience in the clinic visit. Because we do know that if you don't meet the needs, clients may opt out not to come back. And so I think to understand and have measures available about that experience will help you in terms of strengthening the communication flow with the clients and ultimately, hopefully, retention in care and ultimately um, treatment outcomes. And the last slide I have here before I turn it over to Martha is that we subsequent to those activities, we convened um, with the wonderful help 
of our, um, from our partner here, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, IHI for short. And we convened a two-day meeting um, where we comprised um, academic content experts. We had lots of HIV providers. We also had lots of people with HIV, quality managers and others. And we, we tried to convene. And one of the idea was that we wanted to develop a shared understanding of problems and trends. There are many definitions out there, but we really wanted to better understand for those that are participating in this kind of two-day um, expert meeting to hear more about the value um, to really improving patient care using PROMS and PREMS. Then we also wanted to better understand about, so what does it take for sites to adopt PROMS and PREMS? And we want to understand the barriers in terms of collecting, analyzing data, and for us also very important is not only having the data, but also using the data that you just collected to improve those experience and outcomes. And so making a link of problems and problems data to improvement activities. And lastly, this was a very important um, exercise for us is to identify problems and problems domain. There are lots of things you can measure, there are lots of problems and problems domains available, but we wanted to figure out based on the input of those um, 27 participants to figure out a little bit more like what are the top five in each of those. With that, I'm just gonna turn it over to Martha. Um, if you can talk a little bit about the process of prioritization, what we did in our meeting. Thanks, Clemens. And I really do want to share, you know, that as a person living with HIV and previous consumer of Ryan White services, this has been one of the most exciting processes and exercises I think that um, I have engaged in. So the process to prioritize uh, problems, the problems and trends domains included uh, a, basically a three-step process. As Clements described, um, we had brought together a group of experts to be able to contribute to this. Um, and this was all based on research knowledge and the survey data. So the first part of the process, uh, the idea was to review and define the criteria for selecting uh, the domains. And it, you know, ultimately, this resulted in 26 potential PROMS domains and 23 potential uh, PREMS domains. And then the experts had to sort of rate the importance of measuring those domains. Um, and this resulted in a prioritized list of 15 PROMS domains and 13 PROMS domains. But like Clement said, we had to really bring this down, and the experts had to select their top five PROMS domains and five uh, PREMS domains based on an agreed selection criteria. Next slide, please. And so this is the list of PROMS and PREMS domains prioritized. As you can see for PROMS, well-being, housing stability, mental health, discrimination, and food security, all really important. PREMS, racism, respect and dignity, privacy and confidentiality, communication and shared decision making um, and this I, this was a very difficult list based on all the things that could have been um, but this was agreed upon next slide please so cqi has partnered with the institute for healthcare improvement as clement said to, con to to conduct the national survey on these topics um, we had 126 responses uh, between December 6th and January 17th, and this was a mix of multiple choice and open responses and rating scales. Next slide, please. So um, this is some of the results. We'll share some of them uh, based on the description of how familiar, this was familiarity with PROMS and PREMS. You could see like about half were only somewhat familiar, you know, um, less than that said that they were actually familiar with PROMS and PREMS, but you can see that there was a level of uh, uh, being unfamiliar or somewhat unfamiliar being unsure of what PROMS and PREMS was. I myself coming to this process, I've never actually heard of PROMS and PREMS, but as you could see, some of the experts were somewhat familiar with this concept. Next slide, please. And then this question sort of assessed whether they had used PROMS and PREMS in a healthcare setting. Um, uh, less than 50% said yes. And you could see that the rest um, uh, were basically unsure or hadn't used PROMS and PREMS in a healthcare setting. 
and then um, this rated sort of the um, relevance of the proms, the, the proms and the prems to HIV care or the ability to measure. So on the on the left side, we're looking at relevance to HIV care. And as you can see um, really clearly, um, based on patient, you know, the, the, the domains that had been selected, there was a, ultimately a very high relevance to HIV care that was reported. But if you look at the ability to measure, there was definitely a little bit of uncertainty in how um, they could, the, the, the domains could be measured. So this slide um, just calls one of our participants, and, in, and basically I'll read it, within our jurisdiction, there were many providers that were not familiar with PROMS and PREMS, but now there's a lot of interest. When you look at the issues like quality of life, everyone is interested, especially frontline providers. They couldn't have said it any better. There's such a huge interest in this issue because it's very relevant to the service of people living with HIV. Next slide, please. And so we also developed a PROMS and PREMS guide in conjunction with content experts, participants in the PROMS and PREMS pilot project. Um, I participated in this, so it's a really excellent guide that will provide the background information. So it will outline PROMS and PREMS. It provides working definitions and steps to implement PROMS and PREMS, and also tools, checklists uh, for selecting domains and measures which can be a really overwhelming process um, for some of the providers, uh, but it also gives best practices and examples from pilot participants and how PROMS and PREMS data findings can be used to improve HIV care, which I think was always on the background of, pro uh, of the minds of providers as we were doing this, was how this data was going to be used to actually improve the lives of, of people living with HIV. Next slide, please. Thank you, Martha, for, 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 for sharing our background to it. And, and uh, that leads to our pilot project. So um, we're very excited to have recruited. Um, we started out with 10 sites that volunteered to be part of our pilot. The idea was that we wanted to see whether um, the, we can, A, to see whether the, there is a value of PROMS and PREMS, as a important data source to understand um, the HIV care in terms of the impact and outcomes it has on patients living with HIV. But we also wanted to know, to understand like, what is the feasibility of actually measuring PROMS and PREMS um, in a busy randomized clinic, and particularly using then think about how the data can be used for quality improvement activities. So it's testing the feasibility was a big part of, of this project that ran from January of uh, 2022 to June of 2022. Um, part of it also was to identify best practices. Clearly, we wanted to um, capture those wisdoms that were found along the way, um, incorporate them in our guide. And, and also we wanted to um, see how this data once you have it available, can complement ongoing quality improvement activities and efforts. That was a really important one. So um, what was the expectation for participation? It was open to anyone. Uh, no experience was required. We wanted to have a good mix, and it turned out to be. We asked them to the, each of the 10 sites to select one prom or one prem. Marcel talked about the five that were identified in our IHI expert meeting and then confirmed in our national survey. The, idea was that we actually gave, um, so there were, um, after the selection was done, in order to help them for each of our PROMS and PREMS domain, we actually found a validated tool uh, in the literature and uh, gave those questions to be asked in a survey, in an online tool, or any other way to capture the information of PROMS and PREMS and gave that information to our pilot sites. So Martha mentioned well-being or quality of life. So we actually gave um, the survey tool, a recommended tool, and we also um, prioritized five questions we believe are most pertinent for this. And then we asked them to actually start measuring the PROMS and PREMS. 
um, related to the domain that is selected, capture the information, look at the results, and try to use the results for quality improvement. Again, it was not testing whether the problems and problems domain or the measures are valid. It was more like, can you actually incorporate it? Can you measure it in a busy clinic? And we offered uh, monthly group webinars uh, from January to June. We also uh, uh, made um, quality improvement coaches available. And we actually had a coaching team from a content expert, somebody with lift experience and a QI coach come together in one-on-one -on -one support. And then also very innovatively, we, we tried to capture um, the reflection calls where we interviewed the sites along the way um, to better understand what worked for them, what didn't. And as always, particularly in this um, project of Prams and Prams, where I think at the end of the day, it's all about elevating the voice of people with HIV to improve care. And so that they were all part of this journey, as Martha said earlier. So here are the faculty. I, I, a lot of names on here, but I just wanted to recognize the lots of individuals who participated on the faculty side. Um, we all had different roles uh, from um, basically providing um, as a coach, whether you are support, or we also had a writer to help us with writing up the reflections as well as the guide later on. Um, mentioned earlier, we had uh, different types of meetings. Um, we had the group sessions. We tried to come up not only with what is a Prams and Prams, but also like to have very didactic, very important um, calls uh, that really highlight certain aspects. And I remember Martha talked about how to engage uh, individuals with HIV as part of your Prams Prams collection, selection, and reviewing the results. And then we had the individual coaching calls and then our collection calls, as mentioned um, earlier. So here is the, um, the, the timeline we had. Um, it was kind of sequentially from pick your domain, we help you with it, pick your measure related to your domain, and then thinking about integration, put it into practice. And some sites were able to do a lot along this journey and some sites, you know, um, we all learn differently at a different pace. But this is roughly where we are. Um, that was our goal for 2022. I want to, uh, before I turn it back over to, um, to Martha again, here is a quote from one of our participants. And the participant said, when you think of quality improvement, you tend to have a clinical focus. The project made us look at a bigger picture, what's going on in our clients' lives. When our clinicians are good at checking in with clients, adding these measures on a permanent basis, we'll formalize our processes. So I think that summarizes very well. We know that nine out of 10 patients um, served by Ryan White are virally suppressed, so they meet the optimal treatment outcomes but as Bobby, it reflective of whether they have a high quality of life. I can be virally suppressed, but struggling with housing instability. I can be virally suppressed, but struggling um, to, to have food security for my family around me. So I think the quality, some of our measures really address the, the broader um, perspective here. Martha, do you wanna talk a little bit about some of the problems and problems examples? Absolutely, yes. Next slide, please. Um, so one of the domains was well-being, and um, this um, the, the tool that was selected was a hundred M Lives well-being assessment, which is a validated tool, and it was a twelve-question survey. Um, and also included demographics. So you can see um, some of the sample questions that were there. Um, but I, I just remember feedback from, you know, some of the sites that were using this tool in how they kind of had to adapt it as well, uh, based on on the population that was uh, being uh, being um, being surveyed. Um, and I know that, for example, the question of the ladder um, had to be adapted because it confused some people, but I believe that that was part of the process of using a tool, uh, selecting the domain, using the tool, and seeing whether 
um, this could be adapted and used and seeing whether this had, you know, needed to be changed or whatever. So that was a very exciting to be part of the process of a selection and the implementation of, of one of the domains. Next slide, please. Um, housing stability, and I know that, um, you know, one of my colleagues here, Valerie, is probably going to talk about this. But housing stability was also a domain that was very popular. I think it was selected by um, you know more than one of our um, uh, of our of our pilot sites, and the Veterans Administration Homeless Screening Tool was used. It's a five uh, question survey, and some of the sample questions in the past two months: Have you been living in a stable housing that you own, rent, or stay in? Um, um, as you can see that you worried or concerned um, that in the next two months you may not have housing and would you have been referred to talk, would you like to be referred to talk more about a housing situation. And I just remember again in some of the sites, um, some of the sites were already collecting some kind of housing data from 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 other tools, um, but this was just a great way of evolving the patient voices in responding to an issue like housing. And I think we'll hear a little bit more about that. Next slide, please. Uh, mental health. This is a really big issue, um, uh, you know, uh, among people living with HIV. Um, and this is an example of a, a potential tool, the, the PHQ-9, the D depression severity. It's a 10 question survey. Um, and the sample questions are listed there. Again, uh, some of the Ryan White sites may um, have other sort of mental health tools, but this was selected in order for us to be able to, um, you know, have a, have, have a tool that can be used as part of a process for assessing mental health. Next slide, please. Um, the experience of racism was a big one. I had personally been curious as to how this could be measured, uh, but there was a tool that was selected, the Krieger Experiences of Discrimination, a 30 plus question survey, um, and um, it, it had questions that um, asked about the experience of discrimination, um, especially based on race, ethnicity, or color, um, and also, you know, just checking in the last year how you may have felt unfairly treated because of your race, ethnicity, or color. Um, and I would really be, I'm sure a lot of sites would be really excited to implement such a tool because, especially in the past few years, this has, you know, this is some of the uh, issues that have really been focused on in the community. The next slide. Yep, and then communication, there was an, an um, the tool was the Ontario Outpatient Survey, a 63 question survey, and um, there, you know, here are some of the sample questions that would have been used. Um, and the whole idea of this process was really just to test the process of being able to implement these questions and get feedback from the patients themselves about what it was like to participate in this survey um, and whether this is something that could be done on a large scale. Next slide. Um, so the expectations on selecting a, a PROMS, and, uh, PROMS domain, I think this is really critical and I was uh, excited to be part of the, um, the process as the site sort of selected which PROMS and, and PROMS domain um, that they would work with. Um, even using the sort of the criteria, the guidance that was given. I think we always want to start by understanding what data is already being collected and how it's being used. The real goal of selecting that PROMS or PROMS do domain in, 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 in February and selecting our specific measure um, to be able to start in early. Thank you so much, um, Martha. Um, very much appreciated. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about some of the success. As you know, we had uh, we started out with ten sites. Eight sites were uh, were able to complete our pilot, and we I want to highlight and and obviously I want to give a lot of um, kudos to our central Aradat, our colleagues and 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 friends in Puerto Rico about really um, they have done a lot. Um, and there were a lot of uh, facing a lot of different struggles. 
and but they were able to participate um, in our pilot, something that was really important. And in part of it, in, in, in their journey, um, they talked a lot about the, the stigma on mental health, and they were focusing quite a bit on the different domains. And one of the things I wanna highlight here, because I wanna leave a lot of time for Valerie who's here today, is for them, and this is the, a quote from our Central Hour Death participant, gathering the data gave me a clearer view of areas that we can focus on for improvement. Owning the questions helped me better to understand the issues. And so I think to have the availability of those measures and, and some of the domains that Martha introduced earlier, keep in mind that you can, uh, we'll put the link in, a, in the chat room, you can access all those domains, how you find them, more about the background information for all of them on our website at cqii.org um, and a, a website we're working on to really share all the wonderful resources that we're able to, to, to gather. We also want to highlight an, an example from the Eau Claire Cooperative um, Health. Um, they were really asking, focusing more on housing. They knew that housing was an issue, but they also wanted to include that measure in their EMR, the Electronic Medical Record System, to be sure. Um, and so they had a little challenge, as you know, working with big data systems. It, it, it was not as smooth as they thought. They, it's going to work out, begin. The pilot was test the feasibility of getting the data systematically in. And um, while the whole process was a little bit frustrating, but because they had to go back and forth with medical and many others, they were really saw the value of actually asking questions on housing. And that was a very important lesson learned for them and really make a difference. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to, to Valerie. Valerie, um, uh, first of all, I wanna thank you for participating in our pilot. And we're looking forward to hear more about your experiences. Valerie. Yes, so as Martha uh, mentioned in her earlier slides, we ultimately chose our Proms and Prems project to be on the housing stability domain. Um, and we initially chose this because this is a problem that a lot of our clients face. Um, and we were hoping that we would be able to maybe um, find some more tools to alleviate those stressors from our clients. Um, we have a few different options for housing in our area. Um, our agency owns four different buildings, um, family units, as well as um, single, single person units, um, both transitional and permanent housing. And we also have the ability to provide financial assistance for scattered site um, placements. So as I mentioned, this is an issue that a lot of our clients face, um, even with support from our organization. So to gather our data, we compiled a survey from one of the validated measures that Martha went over. Um, and this survey initially focused on just the stability of housing. Um, and what we found is that the data that we were gathering was already information that we knew. Um, we were able to pull a report from our database um, to determine stability, um, for our clients' housing um, statuses, and the data aligned with that. So we weren't finding anything new. So we had the pivot. We changed our um, survey to focus more on the financial feasibility of housing, um, and that included rent, um, utilities, but also being able to afford food. Um, and so we've only not been able to gather as, as many responses as we gathered with our initial survey. Um, but what we're finding so far is that 65% of our respondents are worried about being able to pay for their uh, rent, food, and utilities in the future. So this is more so data that we can do something with um, and data that we you know, wanted to gather. And um, so what we're hoping to do with this is um, potentially hold finance, financial literacy classes um, to address some of these issues, um, but then also within that, maybe uh, having a budgeting class um, for clients to be able to afford all of their uh, monthly utilities and, and food resources. And so that was our experience with um, the housing stability domain and our journey. Um, so I'm going to hand it off to Martha to talk about the lessons learned with this Proms and Prems project. Thank you, Valerie. And I, I was, um, you know, one of the coaches that worked with you, and I really appreciated your journey in just, um, you know, going through the first part of 
uh, selecting a survey, dom the domain, and then selecting a survey, and then pivoting. I think that was such a critical lesson learned uh, for many others that it's okay. If we could go to the next slide, please. Um, so yes, um, you know, just as Valerie was saying, different domains require different actions, right? Housing stability requires more intervention than well-being, which can vary according to sites. And I'll really say that I appreciated um, Valerie's sort of intentionality about whatever data we get, we want to use, we really want to help these clients with their housing issues. Um, testing early, testing often. I think that came out from a lot of our sites in the, in, in the sense that, you know, after they selected their measure and, and felt that this was appropriate for their patients and feasible in the existing work plan, they started to test. Um, they, uh, uh, they started to test and some of them wanted to incorporate some of the, the surveys into the electronic medical records. But it was important to see that you still have to test and you have to test often in order to understand, you know, how the process is working. It was okay to start small, um, you know, lacking access to consistent patient involvement, which was um, a struggle for um, uh, some of the places, but they were very intentional. That's one of the places I was really excited to work with the sites. It was okay to just rely on, on one peer or, or one staff member or one patient to get uh, feedback in the measures or, or a cab or whatever it was, but it was okay to start small in getting consistent patient involvement and feedback and then making sure that the data was actionable. I think this was uh, really seen across the board that people wanted to get data, make that data collection worthwhile for both the staff and the patients by channeling those responses and ultimately the data into action. Um, and I, I know, for example, that with Valerie's site, this was the intention, this was the passion. We want to make sure that this data is actionable in order to help our clients. And so I think this kind of summarizes what we're saying. You know, this um, is a quote from a Thomas Street Health Center participant. We've learned that responses can be complex. Patients indi indicate satisfaction in one area, such as having a purpose or support from family and friends, but then they say they feel lonely. We now need to craft a, res a response to these needs. Um, and yeah, they couldn't have said it better. Ultimately, with the client experience um, and client outcomes, they are very complex because we live very complex intersectional lives. But I think this pilot was a great way of just testing and finding data in small ways that can begin to help um, better to, to develop better outcomes for some of those patient experiences. Thank you so much, Martha. And I want to thank you. I, I think I want to bring this uh, presentation to a close by just thanking our presenters. I want to thank the faculty. I want to thank all the participants. And I wanted just to um, just point our contact information. We're going to put this all in the chat. We're going to put some of the resources in the chat during the conference. And hopefully you take lots of advantage of it. And lastly, uh, before we certainly welcome your ideas, comments, um, also for since the session um, allows you to get uh, continuing education credit, um, please follow the link we're also going to put in the chat. With that, I'm going to close formally our presentation and we'll look forward to engage you in a discussion, what you heard and all your thoughts and ideas. With that, I'm going to close our session again, Martha and Mallory, I really want to thank you. And with this, we conclude our presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us uh, in the Ryan White Conference. And here we are. This time is going to prom. Learn to dance with the community and measure what moves them most. Remember, what moved them most. Here are, uh, we have the presenters. Uh, our Dallas County Health Advisor, Regina Waits, uh, our friend and coach, Michael Hager, and myself, Oscar. Please, next slide. None of the presenter has any relevant financial interest in to disclose. So next, here we are. Regina, our health advisor, Michael, I would say, and myself. This is our 
portion of the team, the other portion of the team are on the other presentations. So this is a team effort as well. Next. Learning objectives. Uh, the objectives, it's, it's important to keep that in mind. Describe the importance of the customer experience outcomes as a driver for performance excellence. It's, it's very, very important to involve consumers, as we said in the previous, uh, uh, <clears throat> sorry, explain how to develop relevant patient reported outcome measure. It's on PCM 15 or two, using service unit definition, like it's stated on the PCM 16 or two, and social determinants of health framework. As you can see, big project, DHE, FTC, and HAS, et cetera. This component of the community involvement in the measure development process. So keep an eye on those three objectives. And next. Quantitative and qualitative. This is go back the ball to, okay, Regina, thank you. Thank you both. Um, hello, and what we're moving forward to through is our, our quantitative and our qualitative CQM performance measures um, here in the Dallas EMA HSDA. And <clears throat> next slide, thank you. Um, one of the most, uh, most important innovations we've had come out in our field in 2011 was the HIV care continuum. Our quantitative care markers that can be quantitative care markers that can be used to describe outcomes such as testing, linkage, retention, ARV prescription, and viral suppression. Implications for the left or the prevention side of the care continuum, and, and then include status and payer neutral applications. <clears throat> it allows for easy segmentation to identify disparities and other inequity in care funding, care funding, access, and outcomes. It also applies more neatly to clinical services than to supportive services. Next slide, please. Quantitative data are reliably countable with clinical data, demographic data, and financial data. Um, and our qualitative data are not readily accountable, but can be coded in a way that can make them measurable in an objective way. So we, we're forming where we can, um, where we can just ask the people what they think about the services. So we can do that through key stakeholder uh, interview data, focus group data, comment cards, and survey data. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Our social determinants of health emphasis needed so on there. So in order to end the HIV epidemic, we need to have a sense of how social determinants of health intersect in key populations. Again, with our real data, we're making assumptions and that's not what we wanna do. We want to grasp the information directly from our consumers. We need a scientific process that allows us to specify our patient reporting outcome measures and our <clears throat> in our prems as well in an efficient manner that involves the community at, at every step, include, including them in the process at every step. Evidence-based co-design, also known as EBCD methods, are the answer. EBC the is the concept that the community is an essential planning partner. EBCD also means that the providers and the potential consumers are included in the creation and testing of our measures. And our, our consultants, our CQM consultants, have a full toolkit um, for EBCD for, for e e ending the epidemic, and this is a part of it. Hey, Regina, I just want to jump in real fast um, to engage a little bit in conversation because I think this point is really important. You know, when we talk about the HIV care continuum in Ryan White, we're so used to that. It's the HIV testing linkage, you know, all those things that we mentioned, but the prevention side, 
you know, of things. How many HIV tests? Where are the HIV tests? Um, you know, uh, how is access to condoms? How is access to PrEP? Those other uh, care continuum bars to the left of where we pick up in HIV treatment are really important, especially when we think about rapid start and um, making sure that we meet clients where they're actually at. So I, I really want to, um, you know, just kind of emphasize that for folks that, you know, we, if we want to end the epidemic, we need to understand about transportation, mental health, about support structures, uh, about um, potential um, trauma risk, about, you know, the things that are really the drivers for whether or not people are accessing care. And, you know, the, the comment here about real data um, is an important one, because if we're only looking at quantitative data and not qualitative data, then we don't really understand what's happening beneath the surface. And, you know, it's called prejudice when you're judging something, what's happening beneath the surface based on what's on the surface alone. So this information is essential for us to have a much better understanding of what's happening for and within our clients. And sorry to jump in, Regina, but I just, I really wanted to make that point because it's so important for our work. No problem at all. Thank you so much for, for sharing that with us, Michael. Alrighty. So how do you know when a measure is good and or valid? Um, validity testing has four components, um, which is professionally assessed by experts, is face validity, content validity, concurrent criteria, and inter-rate of re reliability. Face validity, just to give you a few definitions, um, ask if, if the question, does the question approach or encompass basic premise of what that what that service or what's on the surface what it actually means so face the, the actual face of the, the question our content validity does it does a question that we ask for each service category does that question um ask and approach the, and contain all of the meaningful reasons for that service concurrent criterion is comparing the question or the approach um, with other existing gold standards to assess the Ryan White service um, in a similar fa fashion. So are we what's comparing and contrasting? And then inter-rater reliability, um, will different people with different cognitive states and cultures uh, interpret the question and the responses in the same exact same way? Um, and so similar assessment steps are used in psychometric testing. And what is psychometric testing, you ask? Well, that's when we use focus group processing to involve the experts. Of course, that's our community, involving them in the process and asking them these questions. Um, primer training is needed to ensure common baseline understanding is, is available. And then the National Quality Forum has resources to support this process as well. And it will be in the toolkit for this session. It will be made available as well. Ideally, to take on consumers trained on a conveyor by an um, Indian epidemic agency. But for now, we're working through the planning council. The usually in the past, that's what usually has happened. But right now, we're working through the planning council to establish our new relationship here in Dallas. Now, I'm ready to move forward and pass it over to. Michael, is, or is it hand the ball over to you now? Thank you. All right. Thanks so much, Ms. Regina, um, for walking us through the uh, reasons why it's important for us to have um, both quantitative and qualitative measures in our uh, measurement portfolio in the Dallas EMA and HSDA. And now I'm going to turn the corner and talk a little bit about how we made ours. Um, in, uh, in our uh, region and uh, specifically how we use the PCNs to help us uh, frame these issues. So um, let's just take a step back and um, look at our PCN 1502 application. We know um, most of you um, on the line are familiar, but uh, it's the framework that we use to create uh, the quality program in Ryan White. Um, it also uh, tells us which service categories require the performance measures and how many performance measures are required. So uh, we have a workflow image in the next few slides here, but just to kind of give you a sense of what this is, we use utilization data from last year to look at um, what measures uh, we can set up this year. Um, so we create this uh, work group process uh, 
you know, that involves the providers and also some community members to help us uh, develop measures. And then those measures are uh, published for use in the following year. So, you know, typical Terrain White, we're um, operating in three years at a time. Uh, we're analyzing data last year to um, develop a new system this year that's going to be in place for next year. Um, you know, uh, there's ties to this process that relate to infrastructure performance, measurement, stakeholder involvement, um, and much more. Um, and it's one of the reasons why we've designed our process for uh, developing PROMs and the psychometric validity testing of those PROMs um, in this way, because it also helps to accomplish many of the other objectives that uh, PCN 1502, um, you know, compels us or implies that we should be doing. Um, it's really important to know that our process has been worked into a part of our standard CQM program evaluation, and we do evaluate it on both levels. We evaluate it for ourselves um, as the administrative agency. We are a combined Part A, Part B in the Dallas region. Uh, so we actually use uh, a version of the organizational assessment that was adapted by um, the uh, Texas Department of State Health Services um, to evaluate ourselves. Um, then when we evaluate the subrecipients in the field, we've adapted the uh, CQII and HAB Part C and D organizational assessment to evaluate um, the subrecipient uptake of the PROM and PROM process. So we have this structure in place, uh, we follow our process, and then we evaluate ourselves based on whether or not we followed our process, which I think is really strong implementation science and improvement science. So what is this work group? Um, what happens there? So when a service category is identified as requiring some measures, we hold a work group meeting for all of the Part A and B funded providers for that service. Uh, so we basically invite them all to this roundtable meeting. Um, we um, make sure that there's some consumers there as well. Um, the meetings are set to be one hour. And uh, what we do first is we review the purpose of the service category based on HRSA guidance. So we start at PCN 1602. From there, we graduate our understanding and look at both the state and the regional um, service standards that are in place for that specific service. And then because we have the agencies on the line, we ask them how the service is actually implemented in the field. Now, we know that service categories are supposed to be pretty concrete uh, for us to follow, but you know, um, our federal partners leave the most wiggle room for um, states and cities to be able to kind of make something that's more specific. Um, and we want to just make sure that this entire telescoping process of expectations and understandings goes from our federal partners all the way down through the agencies to reach our clients in the field. As a part of this, we also review all the available um, data. So obviously we have utilization data. That's how we know that this is a service that needs to be um, discussed as a work group. But there's a lot of other nuances that go with that. We do stratify um, by key uh, populations that we have in our Dallas region. So we um, combine that with demographics and um, uh, expenditure information and information that we can use as a work group to determine uh, how best to tackle um, a patient reported outcome measure or patient reported evaluation measure for our purposes. <clears throat> Obviously, you can imagine that a one hour meeting doesn't really have enough time to cover all of this material and then have a rich discussion about the possibilities for measurement and what's appropriate and timely. So we do um, schedule additional meetings. Um, all the meetings are recorded and we take really careful notes to show action steps. And we do that because we know that it might be hard for folks to join multiple one hour meetings. Um, so we want everyone to feel included and um, able to provide comments, even if the meetings take place, taking place and they missed it. Um, people who provide that service have up to a week after the meeting to provide feedback on the notes that have been produced. So it is an incredibly inclusive process, um, you know, and we don't let people's individual calendars uh, get in the way of us doing great work and um, including everyone. Um, I should note that almost all the work groups are able to accomplish this in two meetings, uh, so two hours of time to create a measure and go through this full ride. Um, you know, there was one year where one service category needed three meetings, um, uh, but that has uh, only happened once. So once we specify these measures, uh, we ask the providers to take them into the field and to test them with their staff. This is really important, right, because the staff are going to be some of the folks who are helping to distribute these surveys in the field. Um, we get their feedback, we 
adapt the um, the questions and the um, uh, the approach that we use in the Qualtrics system, which is how we uh, distribute our surveys, um, and then we publish them. So this workgroup process happens every year because every year we have utilization data from the prior year to look at. PCN 1502 says we've got to do it, so we go ahead and do it. And we um, ask people in this workgroup process whether or not it's appropriate to have a quantitative measure or a qualitative measure. And as we were um, discussing, uh, as Regina was discussing previously, uh, a lot of times the quantitative measures are best aligned with uh, the uh, HIV care continuum and so would fall out of clinical services um, like um, medical care. Um, but uh, when we think about something like a van company, um, you know, that's much more difficult to align to the HIV care continuum. And so the other question to ask is, so what from the purpose of the consumers? So you got transportation, so what? What value did it add for you in your opinion? Don't let me as a system tell you how it added value to your life. I want to hear from you specifically. So um, it's really important to know that this workgroup process is a really meaty conversation about the principles of measurement and what's most appropriate for the intent of the service, the way the service is being delivered, and the intended outcome that we wish our clients to feel as a product of receiving the service. So again, here is our, two, um, our full two-year process explained. You can see the, the last year piece, um, year zero, is where we are uh, you know, getting that utilization data um, all together. And by the time we get to January, then we have um, new data that is um, you know, published from the prior year that we can use for our decision-making purposes. So we um, look to see which service categories based on the math are requiring measures, um, if any of our current measures um, should be retired. Um, it's really important to note that we follow PCN 1502 to the key and we don't overburden providers by keeping around measures that are no longer indicated as being required for the PCN. Um, you know, information is great, but as a public health practitioner and a person living with HIV, I can attest that public health can run amok sometimes and, you know, just be a little bit too crazy and busy. So we do retire measures when, um, when uh, the math indicates that it's appropriate to do so. So once we know what kind of work groups we need um, for what service categories, we go ahead and call those work groups and schedule them. Uh, you know, as many meetings as it takes, as many notes and as much back and forth and emails as it takes. Uh, but then eventually um, we have measures to test and we uh, uh, update those measures and publish them. And then you can see that um, in the following year, we collect one quarter of data and then we host our focus groups with the community. Providers are not allowed to participate in those meetings. Um, if you are a, a consumer of service who happens to also work in a provider organization, that's fine. But we're really trying to get you know, people who are you know, purely consumer-minded, purely community-minded, um, to help us uh, unpack what's appropriate uh, for measures. And um, so the focus groups work through um, a series of questions. Um, they're two hours long. Um, there are incentives provided for people to join them. Um, and we ask them questions about whether or not, um, as uh, Regina mentioned, um, face validity. What is the meaning of the service? Do you see the definition of the service in the question that we're asking? Um, content validity. Um, are all of the possibilities for the way the service can and should be used um, as it's important to you as the community included here? Is there anything that we're missing that would be really important for the system to know so it can better plan to suitably meet your needs as a person living with HIV that we're caring for? Uh, concurrent criterion validity. We ask questions like, um, have you seen this question asked similarly um, or differently in other settings? Um, how else can this question um, be asked? Um, and then for inter-rater reliability, we focus in on a lot of the barriers that we have within um, our population. We think about stigma, we think about trauma, we think about language barriers, we think about cultural barriers, we think about individual preferences about, do I want to speak to someone who um, shares my background and characteristics or is that something that's a non-starter for me? Um, it's really important for us to unpack all the limitations that could affect the way that people talk about and understand what it is that we're trying to ask them and what it is that we're um, intending to do with this information. So we can capture all of this wonderful discussion from um, people living with HIV, take very detailed notes, 
And this information goes into the next work, next year's work group process. So they have that um, as an important primary tool to use in identifying whether or not a change is necessary to a measure, um, or if there is any cross service category learning that can happen um, in terms of what the focus group uh, content um, had to say. So here are our measures. Um, as I mentioned, we do have uh, quali quantitative measures. Um, you know, we're not focused on those as much today, um, but uh, basically we have uh, three. Um, two of them are part A only, and one of them is um, uh, for part B. <clears throat> but really what we're focused on here is the qualitative measures. Um, and you can see that we have five right now. We have five different service categories that our work groups have identified. It's more appropriate for us to ask a question um, um, from the client's perspective regarding the so what. So when we think about non-medical case management, we're really looking at um, whether or not we've addressed our client's concerns. Um, it's an open-ended question about what are the reasons why you are working with your non-medical case manager? Um, and we code that information in a way to help us understand what are the rough categories of um, need and utilization happening. And very importantly for this service, we ask whether or not the um, provider was able to meet the, um, the purpose or the needs the client had in going and working with the non-medical case manager to begin with. Uh, for medical case management, we have identified a um, select all that apply what are the main um, topics of focus for your work with your medical case manager? So it's um, you know some of the typical clinical things that fall out of Brian White, like help me understand my medication, help me understand my HIV disease, help me understand um, you know things about disclosure uh, and uh, questions like that. But there's other things as well, um, you know, help with uh, personal hygiene, um, help with um, finding access to uh, key clinical resources. Um, and then finally, there are things that are purely from the community's perspective. Um, when I need education about certain topics, um, am I able to get um, that education uh, in a way that makes me feel I know what to do next? I feel empowered as um, a client, as a patient to take the next step. The practical value of transportation, we ask people, um, all the ways that uh, transportation services benefit them. So um, obviously the most important reason is uh, for the um, access to care, but then we also want to know whether or not um, having access to uh, the, a bus pass or um, a van service that has multiple stops, um, if that benefits them in, um, in different ways. Um, oral health self-efficacy. We ask people whether or not they feel they have the knowledge and the tools to be able to take good care of their mouth, understanding how important oral health is and how much of a scary Larry, a barrier it is for people to want to access oral health services on the regular. And then identification of barriers. We ask um, people who have gone through outreach uh, services, what are some of the um, barriers and goals that they have uh, that the outreach coordinator is helping them around and whether or not they have confidence that they're gonna actually um, come out the other end <clears throat> with um, uh, a stronger quality of life and a better um, opportunity to stay engaged in healthcare. You can see that all of these different surveys are entered in the Qualtrics tool. So we uh, collect the data through Qualtrics. Um, the providers are responsible for identifying a means of distributing the survey link. So we've left it to the providers to say that um, this is gonna be done um, at the front end of the visit. It'll be done at the back end of the visit. It'll be done by a medical assistant or um, a social worker or a concierge type will come through the room and um, distribute the link. Some of our um, providers actually email the link following um, visits, especially virtual visits, right? Because we don't have the client physically in the room. Um, but we have um, put it up to the providers uh, to, for them to um, disseminate the link. Um, and the county does provide uh, free iPads um, to the agencies um, that are um, county purchased to be able to help collect this data. Um, basically anything that the agencies need to help get this out there and to collect the data, um, we're supportive of that. Um, it's important to note that we collect this information, um, one survey per client per quarter. Um, and as you know, in PCN 1502, that's important because we have to measure quality 
quarterly. <clears throat> so we're looking at collecting this information um, and analyzing it and feeding it back to the agencies once a quarter so that they have a sense of what they can do with it. So <clears throat> for those of you who know me, you know that I'm a person living with HIV. Uh, so, you know, it's no surprise that I'm a really big fan about things that are all about the community. Um, and so this is really about Howard leaning in um, to bring that consumer voice uh, into the picture. So we already went through this, but I wanted to emphasize for you that these purple stars represent the areas where the community is actually significantly and substantially involved in the process. It's almost the whole time. It's almost the whole time that's not related to us being in the back office, um, pushing paper and calculating numbers. Um, anytime that there is um, a provider opportunity for there to be voice, there is a community opportunity to have a voice. And in fact, when we um, again go think about those um, focus groups for psychometric testing of the data, we uh, don't invite providers there. That's a, um, a community only opportunity. So we really wanted to emphasize with this slide that it is indeed all about the community. There are massive implications for this activity beyond Ryan White. You know, um, Oscar had referenced uh, the ending the epidemic and um, rapid start earlier on. This is essential when you think about the types of questions we're asking, right? Because um, this is information that helps us to figure out on the ground as we go, where are we having the greatest um, emerging needs? Are we able to keep on top of those emerging needs or are we falling behind in some key critical way? Um, what are the most essential elements of a rapid start interaction that we could highlight um, you know, for agencies that don't wish to put their clients through an eight hour you know, intake visit? Um, most agencies are trying to figure out something that's leaner and meaner, that is more effective and kinder to the staff and kinder to the client, more of like a two hour intake visit for rapid start. So how do we know? What are the screenings, initial screenings and intake processes that we could do to be successful? This data is actually giving us a lot of feedback around that. In the state of Texas, we have something called Achieving Together, which is the statewide um, ending the epidemic plan. Um, it's a status neutral approach. So it's really important that we think about um, this process and potentially thinking about you know, HIV testing and maybe doing something that's similar for the HIV testing um, engagement or maybe even with um, prep providing agencies to make sure that we have a sense of what's going well. But even if we don't borrow from the left side of the continuum and just focus on our work here on the right side of the continuum in Ryan White, um, Achieving Together is very much focused on um, helping to achieve uh, our goals, the same goals of um, EHE, the 90-90-90. Um, US fast track cities. This is um, a very, very clever way to help us um, realign those four key stakeholder groups that we use in fast track cities. I'm a huge fan of Fast Track Cities personally because I think that there is a tremendous value to shaking up or disrupting the way that we typically do business. And so understanding that this patient reported outcome measure methodology is a way to really enhance that power of the consumer stakeholder group at the bottom of the pyramid. And it gives them something that's incredibly action oriented to share with providers and with the health department stakeholder groups so that they can be solutions oriented. As we had mentioned before, if we don't have information about what's actually happening behind the face or underneath the skin of a problem, we don't understand what's happening inside, then we're making assumptions. And those assumptions are often dangerous and they are in fact prejudice. So it's really important for us at all levels of this stakeholder pyramid, even with the chief elected official to stop making assumptions and to start using real, actual, concrete data so that we can realign our um, Fast Track City stakeholder groups in a strength basis. Obviously, this is um, an opportunity to engage trained and knowledgeable consumers um, in an activity. So uh, I know that many of you are familiar with the TCQ+, the block training, escalate, elevate, and it is wonderful to put people from the community through these training programs and to build their capacity. The hazard is if you train people up and then there's no opportunity for them to practice or utilize those skills, that's actually causing moral injury. Think about it. If you're told you get to do this really exciting thing, come to this training, you'll meet wonderful people, you'll learn so much, and then you go and you get so excited and you come home and you're ready to work and you're told, no, 
you can't help. No, that's inappropriate. No, you can't see those papers. No, you're not allowed to join that conversation. No, you don't really have a role in this discussion either. Ugh, right? Ugh. So in terms of your clients who have gone through these types of trainings, this um, activity is a wonderful way to utilize, immediately utilize and leverage those new skills and that new passion base that you fired up within your community. And of course, the National HIV AIDS Strategy um, really is supportive of this method. And um, you know, if, if you're familiar with the revised strategy 2022 to 2025, I'm not gonna get into it here, but of those 78 um, strategies, uh, there are many that are focused on enhancing the community's um, substantial um, input and influence in the way that we design our HIV service systems and of course how we evaluate them. And what better way to involve the community on both ends than doing a process like this where they are indeed involved in helping to establish the measures um, and in collecting the data for the measures, obviously as patients of the service. And then finally, um, in evaluating whether or not this approach makes sense, um, if we should abandon it or if we should um, you know, potentially make some changes um, or anything like that. So I'm going to kick it back to uh, Ms. Regina to talk us through some of the sources and references that we have used to put together our presentation. Awesome, thank you, Michael. So as we begin to close, um, here's some of the um, resources, the references that we have, the sources that we have available. Um, we have the HRSA PCNs and the program letters webpage. The national, of course, the national HIV AIDS strategy, as Michael mentioned, um, the national quality forum of PROMS and PRIMS and other measure development resources. There are scholarly articles on PROMS and PRIMS creation, and there are the links there provided. Um, the ASQ articles on, on measure development and community involvement, and they're listed there as well and the IHI measurement development resources that are available. And if you would like to receive continuing education credit for this activity, please visit ryanwhite.cds.pesgce.com. Thank you so much for joining us and we can't wait to answer your questions in just a few minutes. All right. Well, thank you all so much. We want to thank our presenters. And um, this has been such a timely and interesting topic. So thank you all for all of the time and effort that you all did to um, pull together this presentation. And at this time, um, we want to take a moment to pose some of the questions from our attendees. Um, these are questions that have been collected throughout the presentation. And please note that it, you still have time to submit your question right here in the chat. So at this time, it looks like most have come back on camera. I was gonna ask our presenters to come back on camera, but it looks like I see most of you all here. Um, so at this time, let's jump in here and see what questions we have for you all. Hi, Tanya. I just noticed that um, Clement, okay, Clement just made a co-host again, cool. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah, there we go. All right. All right, so let's see what we got going on over here. I, I think one question that would be probably would love to hear from both of our joint parties here is how can we increase the response rate? I think Ravan was saying that, and I think we should put our heads together because I think we can develop wonderful tools they're not completed, I think we'll fall short. So, um, Regina, Oscar, Michael, do you have any suggestions, you know, how we can increase that? And uh, I think the sure. word dentist was thrown out, monetary and non money incentives, and then maybe we can, with Valerie and Martha and, you know, from our team, maybe we can share some other thoughts and ideas. Sure, Oscar, uh, Regina, definitely feel free to chime in. But um, one of the goals that we have with this is to compare the number of surveys that we get back with the actual utilization of that service in the same period. And that really gives you a sense of the degree of the uh, completion of surveys. Um, you know, there's quite a bit said about how much of the survey, um, how many surveys or what share 
of the return on the surveys, um, you need to capture in order for it to be, you know, a good or useful survey, you know, response. I think um, implementation science tells us that uh, you just keep trying new things and then you dust yourself off and try again to find that Aaliyah moment, as I like to say. Um, in the end, as I'd mentioned, um, we have asked the agencies to help us uh, tackle this question and to use their CABs as the main way to um, identify the best method of uh, distribution. But then there's also their internal conversations at their CQM committee meetings uh, where they can discuss this as well. As I'd mentioned, we're only in our second uh, year of this. So um, we are in fits and starts. Um, some agencies um, you know, are better at reporting um, and providing results for certain services than others. Some agencies are having a hard time producing any results at all. So um, a lot of this is about making sure that we keep our quality improvement hat firmly on and we don't run away with ourselves um, um, and become disheartened. Um, in the end, um, by finding those Aaliyah moments, dust yourself off and try again, and to use a big tent collaborative approach, you'll end up finding solutions that work best. Um, the last thing that I want to address is something that I had mentioned in the talk, which is it's easy for public health to run amok, especially because we're impassioned individuals. But we really care about the community. Um, and then we ask too many dang questions. So um, all of our surveys are actually intended to be less than uh, three minutes. Um, and none of them have more than four questions. And one of the questions is, what agency did you see? And another question is, thank you so much. Can we you know, contact you back. So really there's only about two meaty questions, um, which requires people to be super focused and directive when it comes to that, so what for the service? I don't know if Regina or Oscar want to weigh in or say anything else. No, I have nothing to add. Perfectly described. Thank you. I think I heard loud and clear, short and sweet and to the point. I think that's a really good one. I would add that the where you asked the question and how to provide access to it, I think is key. Um, I think that's kind of something we need to think through. You know, can it be done in part, when do you ask? You know, do you ask the question about because we came more from a ambulatory care point of view rather than uh, from a more EMA perspective here. But you don't want to ask the question when patients are on the way out. You want to ask them when they wait for something. So at the beginning. It's also important the messenger who introduces the survey and can you itemize the benefit? Why do we ask the questions? And I think that's often um, a busy provider may send a signal that we're really busy, so please fill it out quickly versus maybe a peer can introduce the survey. Um, and I think somehow the messaging of what, why we're doing should come from somebody um, that has the appropriate time um, I think the other part is just to address very specific barriers to complete one. If I get an email, but I don't have an email, or I don't have a laptop, or I don't want to walk down to the library to get access to a on to internet, then maybe I'm not the one who will ever respond to you. But if I have somebody sitting with me and I and somebody with the appropriate um, confidentiality training can help me to complete the survey with somebody, then maybe that's will be one way to do it. Valerie, do you want to unmute quickly and answer the question, maybe from your perspective, how you were able to incentivize and help folks to fill out the survey? Yeah, um, so we actually, we did not offer any incentives um, for our surveys, but what we did, we did a, a few different ways. So um, I printed out some surveys and put them in our conference room where most of our case managers meet with their clients. So it could be done, you know, at the same time that they're meeting with the case manager or on their way out. Um, but we also, and this is how we got a majority of our responses, we printed off a survey and included it in our bi-monthly newsletter um, and also included a return envelope like already stamped and everything. And so that's how we got a majority of our responses. But we also sent out a, a link to a Google quiz and um, had it available that way. So we did quite a couple of different methods. Um, and I do think that sending it out with our newsletter did provide us with most of our responses. Uh, and yes, we do mail our newsletter. There's a wonderful intervention called consistent messaging, which is basically says that all the, the staff and everybody in the clinic will send a very signal to the patients. Basically, the message here, consistent messaging could be, we would love to hear from you. It's important to hear from you. 
And therefore, if it's iterated by everyone, not only from the case manager, but medical staff, the support staff, and everybody across, then hopefully that message gets through to the to the clients that we want to honestly hear from you. As far as integrated reliability is concerned, that's one of the biggest issues that we explore in um, our focus groups is thinking about what are those um, situations that or instances where one person may answer differently. And as dynamic individuals who have lives and emotions um, and also bodies that can be scary and go wrong, sometimes we can think about that too, that depending on how I'm asking how you catch me, I might answer this survey differently. So this is a really, really important element, not only in terms of the validity um, you know, of the survey question or approach itself, but also in terms of thinking about how um, people are prepared or made ready for this. So making sure that staff is prepared to you know, really support the survey and the process is key. You know, there was, oh, go ahead, Oscar, please. No, no, I, it, it's a, <clears throat> I would like to mention one detail, very important detail that happened. It's a finding, coincidentally, the client brings on topics that are not within your purview as a CQM, but is within the process of the service delivery. So it's always an opportunity to bring the quality across the borders of CQM within your division or department. So it's something that happened in our, in our data when they provide the feedback and the, the feedback actually is asking for changing some processes on the, who knows, on the programmatic, on the service, on the, not just the medical, but the, the portion of the intake. So it is a lot of feedback that contribute with the quality of the service. And just hear back from that client and call them back is an incentive and that client will be a voice for the group to pass it around and yet answer that question. I mean, it's important to give it back to the client who provide that service, who provide that feedback, call back. It's a good incentive just to hear from someone from the clinic and the patient need that validation. And when they go to the groups, they are very vocal and you get, you gain that honest opinion, which is very difficult to gain when you have people who come to the, to the groups like by routine, you hear the same, same, same. When you catch that intervention, that opinion, actually spread beyond the borders of CQM within the program. It actually access the fiscal, access the programmatic, access the administration, policy changes. So it is is good to have that, but be ready to respond. Analyze that and, and check your your office and check your system, and you are ready to provide that response for this. Uh, individual who gonna be who want to be contacted, so it, it's just a um, some feedback that I would like to drop in the in a group. That like, be ready not just on CQM, be ready in your programmatic and service delivery as a whole component. So there is one question in the chat that I don't believe you all addressed yet. Um, the question reads: Who mm -hmm. facilitates consumer? and customer focus groups if no staff is presently trained? Um, do you train a member of the Consumer Advisory Council or someone on the board? I love that question. Um, so currently, Jamie and I um, are helping to lead the groups in uh, the Dallas area. We're both trained in um, uh, mixed data methods and also in qualitative methodologies. Um, but a product of our training, um, for and coaching of the county staff is to over time transmit those skills, um, capacities and confidence to them. Um, in addition, um, you may have caught that um, while they weren't ready yet this year for us, the Southern Black Policy and Advocacy Network is a wonderful partner funded by the Ending the Epidemic Program in Dallas and they're creating a conveyor of consumers. And so um, it stands to reason that over time, we're gonna be able to transmit among some of the key leaders that emerge from that program um, the same skills. Um, as a person living with HIV, one of the things that's most important about um, 
ending the epidemic and our movement where we are right now is all of the wonderful stuff that we heard earlier today in the plenary. We need to find opportunities to share as much of this expertise and this skill as possible around. There is so much need out there. There is so much room in the marketplace. It's silly to hold on to ideas and say, it's mine, I'm not sharing. So our goal really is to work with these community partners and to build their capacity um, so that we get rid of the old ice on your own paper keeping model and we think about something that's a collaborative um, solution that'll lead to a better tomorrow for everyone. Yeah, I, this, this is comment that I think might take and then I think I also see an EBCD comment which I may combine here. Don't make the enemy, uh, the, you know, don't make the perfect enemy of the good. If you don't, if you don't know anything about focus group, come up with the questions you want to ask. And I think one of the tools that were shared today is there's some really wonderful tools out there to really pinpoint what are the key questions to ask. And then, you know, learn a little bit about focus group because I can see as a big AMA, when a big system, um, there may be more resources available. If you're in a small program, you may not have the luxury, um, but, you know, learn about it. I think the most important thing I feel is that we learn to really listen with empathy. And if you listen with empathy, you have a focus group and you know gather a few uh, figure out what is the key things quick questions you want to get there are lots of wonderful validated tools out there about housing food and everything else pick some of them pick the five questions you, you feel are most pertinent to your development to your to your um, patients and just ask if you ask the question you will hear and over time you learn all the skills um, about this ebct there is a wonderful um upcoming um, oh, somebody, Regina, thank you for putting out. We, we just uh, launched our learning lab, which is a virtual um, learning um, course um, about co-production of HIV services. Um, it's evident, you know, experience-based co-design. And um, we would love to have you um, be there. It's a virtual training. And I'll put a little bit more into the chat in a second. Uh, Michael, um, you mentioned EBCD quite a bit. Do you know where you where you can point folks for more resources and ideas about EBCD? Clemens, I, I just wanted to add um, to the discussion, especially in terms of you know how um, people had talked about in, how we engage people in surveys, who's conducting the surveys, and how Michael so you know eloquently spoke about this need for capacity building. And I, I really wanted to emphasize that there is a larger need to continue to invest in the capacity building of consumers to be able to undertake such projects, to be able to lead such projects. Um, we've been able to do it under the um, you know, sort of the umbrella of quality improvement, but most times, and I think that question came up in the chat about sort of compensation, incentives, and so on and so forth. A lot of this um, work some, sometimes is done voluntarily or by consumers that are already uh, employed by some of the agencies. So with all the evidence that has been out there, especially in terms of this issue for PROMS and PREMS, I think there will really be a need um, to continue to invest in in the capacity, as well as the ability of consumers to be able to assist in the implementation of um, any quality improvement projects. So we are coming close to our time. We have about two minutes left. Um, anybody have any other questions, any closing remarks, anything that you would like for our guests to know or any resources that you'd like for them to know about before we close? Yeah, I just dropped in the chat room a little bit more about that toolkit that um, I'm developing with people um, around the country. And if people want to reach out to me um, to ask more, I'm putting my email in the chat and also Jamie's. Fantastic. I wanted to just, uh, my closing remark, congratulate to the, the Dallas EMA for all their hard work and uh, look out for our, it's just approval at the HRSA level um, we have developed a wonderful proms prams um, implementation guide um, we have worked with lots of member with not only with our 10 sites um, and um, it's really a step-to-step -step guide to really think about um, proms and prams for implementation at the local level 
and we really ho hopefully look out for our upcoming. We hope to have it launched today as part of our, but the approval process wasn't as quick as we hoped for, and um, look out for you know, our guide. And um, um, it, it's really hopefully a wonderful resource for many about you. It's, it's very it's very detailed, and it goes through all the processes needed for um, any sites um, to implement it. And I'd like yeah. to echo that too. It was so great to share the stage with my former boss, uh, Clevin Steinbach, and also, um, you know, to share two similar but um, slightly different ways of thinking about um, proms and prems. Um, so this was really, really neat, and I'm glad that we were paired together. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone, for your participation today. As a part of the HIV and AIDS Bureau's efforts to provide you with timely topics and interesting speakers, we appreciate you filling out the session, the session evaluations at the end of each session. If you are seeking continuing education credits, please complete the additional evaluation for credit. To access the evaluations, please return to the session page within the platform and click on the blue evaluation link. Again, thank you everybody for joining us today. And this concludes our session for the afternoon. Thank you everybody for your help and thank you. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.